Joining us today to talk about the top lies of the capitalist order is Professor Richard Wolf. He's the host of Economic Update. Professor Wolf, thank you for joining me on the program today. Thank you, Juliana, for such a dramatic opening. It's very sweet for you to prepare that. <laughs> I'm I'm glad that you liked it. I thought it was fitting. And um you know, I'm happy to be starting our year with you, 2020. I, I do thank you for all the other appearances that you've made. And and um, just talking with you is, is, I think, so important because you do that thing. You show people the lies in which they have been uh, just surrounded by the lies that prop up this order that then turns around and oppresses them. Um, we talked right before this about meritocracy. Did I miss anything in terms of what mer the idea of meritocracy does, uh, the falsehoods that lie in that idea, and um, how it props up capitalism? No, no. If anything, you were kind. You did not talk about some of the other ones. And I thought I'd just add one basic point. You know, you really can't have it both ways. If you want to believe that you live in a meritocracy where the people who rise up in a village, in a building, in an enterprise are those who've worked the hardest and have the greatest merit, then there has to be what people have always called a level playing field. You can then reward, everybody starts with the same and you see how well each of us can do. But we don't have that and we therefore can't claim a meritocracy. The children of Jeffrey Bezos or Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, they don't start on the same level playing field that anybody else does. I remember when I arrived at Harvard University, where I went to school, the child of immigrants who had no money at all, I very quickly learned that the bulk of my fellow students there came from very well-heeled backgrounds. They had all visited foreign countries. They had had tutors. They had been exposed to all manner of enrichment programs that my parents didn't even know about and couldn't have afforded anyway. Uh, there was no level playing field. Because I went well, to a public I, high school. They all went to Exeter and Andover, et cetera, et cetera. Did I mean, that I go into it forever? Yeah. But there's no level playing field. You can't claim that people got to where they got because of their merit. And by the way, we all knew that. It's yeah. not what you know, it's who you know. And all of us learned that. Professor Wolf, I had the exact same story. I'm the first generation child of uh, immigrant parents. And uh, I, you know, I wound up at a very good university. Um, immigrant parents often tend to rely on the education system to help their children move ahead. Do you think it had lasting effects on you to be one of the very few who understood what it was that people in the world, people, normal, non-well-heeled people were going through. I mean, what was the effect personally, if you don't mind my asking, on you being at these schools with these types of folks? Because I know it did have an effect on me. Yeah, it did have an effect on me. And I think the effect was complicated. I think, to be honest, that there were parts of me that became jealous. I mean, uh, I would occasionally visit their homes. And if I ever needed a refresher course on the difference between them and me, one minute in their apartment on the Upper East Side of New York or in their country house uh, up in Essex, Connecticut or something like that, and you saw real quickly what the difference uh, was. So there was an element of that. Then there was the fact that I got a lot of attention at those places because it became important for some of the folks there to make sure a person like me allowed into their hallowed halls uh, would come to celebrate and reinforce their sense that they belonged at the top of this pyramid. But it happened in my case, and that's a lot of my personal history, that all those efforts to persuade me, they didn't work. The, system, the system around me was so obviously unfair, so obviously cruel to those who didn't have the wealth and the opportunity that you would have to been blind not to see it. Many of my fellow students saw it, but had a deep-seated sense that this is the way the world is, that there's nothing you can possibly do about it. So if you're- Well, that's a nice between, justification to do nothing. 
Exactly. And yeah. so they went along. And that's what they've been doing uh, much of the rest of their lives. I don't envy them for one minute. I'm very happy I spent my life as a critic of a system that needs criticism. And I'm glad I didn't spend my life moving money from one rich person to another by working as a stockbroker or an accountant or all the rest of those professions that my fellow students uh, went to. And, and so I, I was shaped in my way by these institutions, but not in the way they had hoped or intended. Fascinating. Thank you for sharing that personal story. I know we weren't we weren't intending on going personal, but I, I I'm very glad that you did. Um, so in addition to meritocracy and the lack of level playing field, what are the other top lies that people aren't really aware are lies that are propping up this oppressive system in which we live? Well, I thought I would pick a couple of them, uh, knowing that you were going to ask, and I want to pick one which is in the headlines all the time, so people will begin to understand it. And this has to do with COVID and what a society needs to do to cope with a virus like this. We've had them before in human history, in American history. We know exactly what kind of damage they can do. We know pretty well what you have to do to deal with them. This is not new. Nothing is new about COVID. So the only question is, was the society we live in, American capitalism, was it able to mobilize the private resources, the public resources, to deal with this problem effectively? And the lie is the pretense that we did. We didn't. We are an immense, and I say this with no pleasure, we are an immense failure. Let me, let me give you just two dimensions. And I'm, I'm on purpose using the People's Republic of China as the other because it gets such a bad rap in this country. And it has its warts and its problems, just like every other society does. But on this question, there's no contest. As of today, the number of Americans, fellow citizens of you and me, Juliana, who have died from COVID is listed as 826,000 people. Mm -hmm. The People's Republic of China, where the virus began and where it has therefore been the longest, has a population four times larger than us, and they've not yet hit, get ready, 8,000 people. We have a hundred times more deaths from COVID than does a country four times larger than us. There is no excuse. Let me give you another statistic. New York City, as of today, yesterday in New York City, and I checked so I'd have it right, 86,000 people tested positive for COVID one day in one city. That's 10% now, of the town. Isn't that 10% of the whole city? Something I mean, like that. That's wow. right. something like that. Holy cow. Um, so it's a little smaller, but in any case, Still, there's close. a province that's getting a lot of attention these days in China. Xi'an province, X-I apostrophe A-N is how it's spelled. That province in China has an intense lockdown uh, imposed by the Chinese government to control the COVID outbreak that ha happened there. That much our media tell us. What they don't tell us is how many cases of COVID they had yesterday in this province that they're shutting down. Get ready. 122 cases tested positive. 86,000 in New York, 122, and the population of that province in China is larger than the population of the city of New York. So these are failures. You can tell us how tough it is for the people in Xi'an province. The government is shutting everything down. That's what we hear. That's a lie, and it's a lie not because the specific things that are said are untrue. I wouldn't know how to evaluate that in any case, but let's assume they're true. The reality is, though, that they have contained this disease. They don't have millions of people sick, hundreds of thousands dead. That's the most important fact, and that's the one left out. That's a lie. That's huh? misteaching your own people, and it'll come back to haunt us that we have such 
crude propaganda instead of honest reporting. I'm actually finding it more difficult to be in a, a society where the disease is running rampant and we are not all in agreement or we're not all kind of locked down. Uh, for example, my ch I got an email. My, your child's doctor's office is closed because we don't have the staff to run the office. It's closed today. It might be closed tomorrow. Well, what do I do with my appointment? What do I do with what, you know, so that tosses all of that into when I go to the grocery store, they're lacking in produce because they couldn't get it delivered because of a storm, but also, you know, pe people calling out because of COVID. There are no rules in the store. So when I'm shopping, I have to go to the left of the one guy with the chin mask on. You know, there are all of these. We're worried that, you know, certain school districts certain schools in my child's district have closed down. Certain others are open. Well, I still have to go to work. Uh, you know, if it's, it's crazy making and, and it makes you insane from one moment to the next. Um, it, to me, it seems like these are real signs of a, a crumbling order in which we're living right now. I don't see how any other conclusion is possible. I mean, we are now entering the third year of this pandemic. It basically happened two years ago. So we're entering the third year. You would have thought even before it hit that we would have been smart enough to have backup. If you have a disease that affects a lot of people, if you have anything that could exhaust a lot of people, you have to have backup. For example, every aspect of our military understands that if social, if soldiers at the front get exhausted by what their situation is, you've got to have refreshments. You've got to have refreshing uh, groups of people who can stand in. Obviously, after two years, we know what can happen from COVID. It's just been a lesson to us. How is it possible that there's no backup? That when you call up, I went to my bank the other day across the street from where I live. There was a little hand sign, and I don't mind mentioning TD Bank. It's a big one, at least in the Northeast here. TD Bank closed. I have my safe deposit box. If I had been scheduled to go on a trip and needed to get my passport, I wouldn't have been able to. I mean, right. this is not, and there's no explanation, yeah. no telephone to call. That's when you crazy. call the general number, you're told, we're very sorry. It may take a while to answer your phone because, because we're, we're short of staff. I mean, yeah. whoa. Yeah. You know, th wow. This is the kind of thing which will eventually become humor in the United States because the if breakdown, you, you, you laugh <laughs> because the alternative is that you're going to cry. It is uh, a breakdown. Here's another one. Because Wait, I Professor wanna... Wolf, I just want to be clear on what is the lie under that's um, that you were talking about around the, the COVID lockdowns versus not lockdowns? I think the basic lie is this. You don't want to tell the people that in order to keep business going in America, to keep the profits flowing, employers, who are a very small number, need their workers to come to work. And so they want that large number to come. If they get sick, then they can stay home and you'll get others. But you don't want, you don't want your business interrupted. The Chinese, and by the way, the New Zealand is another example. They lock down and their records are, in, you know, I looked up New Zealand. You know how many deaths it's had from COVID since this pandemic began? 51. Oh, it's wow. a 51 I knew I should have moved there. It blows you. And this is not a, a, a socialist or communist country or anything like that. So I picked it just to make it clear. We're we're an outlier. We're the one of the worst performing countries on earth and it and really and we're the richest in many ways we have a well-developed medical system you can't blame the doctor you get, but the system as a whole is becoming dysfunctional becoming I mean, impossible for us to live with and lying to the people rather than really, saying hey here's what the truth would be and it, it's really because if the banks would just take a day off, like if all of the banks <laughs> would just close and stop pummeling people for their rent, pummeling people. for If we just took a pause, we would be able to have this kind of paused 
I mean, the idea of a lockdown doesn't sit well with most Americans, just the term lockdown, but a, a pause, another pause. We may have had a pause before, but they certainly didn't pause, you know, your bills from coming due, et cetera. If we just. But here's the irony, Juliana. We are in a lockdown. It's just a crazy, chaotic. I got locked down. I couldn't get into my bank. I, you got locked down because there were no vegetables in that part of the supermarket because they couldn't be brought. We are having a, a succession of mini lockdowns here, there, and the next place. But the difference is there's no logic to them. They're not part of a program yeah. to defeat the disease. They are an accommodation to the disease so it can continue. We're not taking the steps, vaccination, masking, distancing, that could have been done. Look, here's another lie. You have to choose between having your kids in school, getting an education, or bending to the COVID. No, you don't. We could have bent to the COVID and reorganized our educational system. The minute the schools became unhealthy, all of the movie theaters in America became empty, using nothing. That's space. You could have a dozen classes distanced from one another in every movie house, in every concert hall. And I'm not even talking about the big stadiums, which have been empty all this time. Why wasn't there a program to continue education in safe ways that wouldn't cram all those kids in one school building, but open it all up and you a society that locked down and took care of these questions, which is what they've done in other countries, doesn't have our problems. We have now not locked down the first time the way other countries did, and now we're paying the price on the second and third go-rounds. Mm -hmm. Lying always is more about the person who says the lie than about anyone else. <laughs> You're mostly lying to yourself when you lie to other people. Here's another one, though, that just as important. We are now seeing an inflation. I mean, the patience of the American people is unbelievable to me. We've just been ripped off during the greatest pandemic in a century. The rich have gotten much, much richer, as we all know. The rest of us are barely recovering from all of the psychological and family and income and job dislocations of two years. And what does this capitalist system hit us with? Uninflation. Let me be real clear. If your wages haven't gone up by at least 8% January this year from January last year, if you haven't increased your income by 8%, you're falling behind. It means you can't afford with this year's income, what you were able to afford a year ago. That's a horrible thing to do to people who have just gone through a major depression and the pandemic. And yet we permit it. And then we hear what are lies. Uh, the inflation is a mystery, or the inflation comes because of supply chain disruptions, and they're a mystery. Uh, there's no mystery. I'm an economist, that's what I teach. A tiny number of people are responsible for prices in our society. We call them employers. They're the only ones who set prices. If you've ever been an employee, you might have noticed that your job description does not include setting the price of whatever it is you help to produce. You know who sets the prices. They do, the employers. And you know what? They've raised them. That's what an inflation means. The employers have jacked up the prices. Mm. Now, why did they do it? I've got a real flash for you here. Why do employers do anything? They'll tell you, we're in business to make money. Profit is our bottom line. We learned how to run our business profitably when we got that MBA at the business school. That's why they're raising prices, because it makes them more profits. Mm -hmm. That's no secret. Mm -hmm. That's what's going on. The rest is their attempt to get away with doing something good for their profits that hurts the mass of people by finding somebody, anybody else to blame. It's like Mr. Trump telling us that the problems of the American economy could be solved if we wouldn't let the desperately poor families from Central America come to the United States the way everybody else who's white 
came to the United States. I mean, it Unbelievable. You really have to take a step back because these lies are repeated so many times a day that they have a way of kind of sneaking into your mind and sitting there until someone helps you take a step back and you can realize BS when it is flooding you at every turn. Well, that's that's what you've been able to do. That's what we hope that we're doing on this program as well. So it's always a joy to have you on. Any final uh, words? I know you, uh, I, I appreciate your preparation and thought you put into these lies and picking out the, the, the I'm sure there are, there are legion and you've picked out some of the ones that are the most pres present today. Any final thoughts before we have to go? Yeah, one quick one. There's a lot of talk also about the economy recovered from COVID. It didn't. What recovered was the stock market. And there's no surprise because the Federal Reserve pumps money into the banks and insurance companies who have no reason to produce more goods because the American people can't buy them. So they push that money into the stock market. They bid up the price of shares. And those people, the 10% who own 85% of our shares, they're very happy. And since those are the same people that control the mainstream media, we hear about the recovery that they're busy celebrating. Mm -hmm. But for the mass of people, that's a lie. Their economic situation is more precarious now than it was before this pandemic hit. Thank you so much, Professor Wolf. I think that makes everyone feel better that it's not just them. It's not just them. <laughs> oh, gosh. Professor Richard Wolf, find economic update on YouTube and radio stations across the country. And don't forget to support Professor Wolf's work at Democracy at Work. Thanks so much for being with us. I always appreciate it. Thank you, Juliana. And I appreciate that you produce a program like this.